What looked like just a regular Sunday for a 39-year-old Los Angeles, California mom turned out to be very, very different. Quite the opposite, in fact. This case takes on so many twists and turns, and the more that comes out, the more mysterious it gets. Was it murder? Was it an accident? Was it a scandal? What happened to Heidi Plank? Heidi Plank has been missing since Sunday, October 17th, 2021. She's five foot three and weighs 120 pounds. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. She was last seen wearing jeans and a gray sweater and driving her 2017 gray Range Rover. Authorities now believe that Heidi is dead, but her body is yet to be found. In this video footage, you can see Heidi leave her home on Sunday, October 17th with her dog named Seven. Her home is in West LA. Heidi had attended her 10-year-old's football game in Downey that day, along with her dog, but at halftime she left. Her ex-husband and Hollywood salon owner Jim Wayne was there that day as well at the football game, and he had described Heidi's behavior as antsy. Jim said she didn't seem agitated, she might have been a little bit antsy, she left with her dog and she just walked up and said, I'm gonna go. That's the last time Jim and their son saw Heidi ever again. Now later that day, Surveillance footage placed Heidi in downtown Los Angeles, walking down the block with her dog, Seven. In the first video back at Heidi's home, you can see her with her purse and a sweater wrapped around her waist. In this video, you can see that she's not carrying her purse. She has her sweater on and she has something in her hand. And for a brief moment, you can see her look up at the sky or a building. That was the last known sighting of Heidi in public alive. Now, when friends saw this footage, they talked about Heidi's demeanor and they said, looking at the video, it seemed like she was familiar with that area. She didn't have her purse. It looked like she was just taking her dog out for a walk. Another friend said, we know Heidi, we know her stride. She doesn't seem to be in distress. She was definitely walking casually the way she normally strides. Her ex-husband Jim kept calling and texting her that night with no response. And the following day on Monday, October the 18th, her son then texted Heidi multiple times. Jim also messaged Heidi on that day as well. In reports, he also said, I also texted Heidi multiple times to inquire why she left the game early and to see why she was not responding to his calls or texts, meaning their son. In the text to Heidi, their son said, can you please call me back? I've called you two days in a row and you haven't picked up. On Tuesday, he also texted, please call or just text me because I want to make sure you're okay and I'm worried about you. And can you tell my dad if you'll pick me up tomorrow or not? Now, Jim and Heidi were married for a couple of years and they were together for four years, but they have been divorced for nine years. Now, Jim has been out in the public and he has been trying to get answers in Heidi's disappearance. Their relationship does appear amicable and there's a text where Heidi talks about sending flowers to Jim, thanking him for all that he does for their son. Jim also talked about their parenting style and did say that we have completely different parenting styles. I'm a very strict dad. This isn't my first rodeo. I have two older kids. Our son is Heidi's only child and she is a little more relaxed in her parenting style. So now here's where it gets bizarre and we go down a little bit of a rabbit hole. Number one, neither Jim nor Heidi's friends know why Heidi would be downtown. Over the next few days, there were no texts, no calls from Heidi to her son, which Jim found extremely unusual. On Wednesday, October 20th, Heidi was set to pick up their son from school and she didn't show up, prompting Jim to make a missing persons report. He knew something wasn't right. He said, Heidi did not appear at school, so we became even more worried. Our son and I went to the police station directly after I picked him up from school to file a missing persons report. She's a devoted mother who would never ever leave her son. We have a 10 year old boy at home that's looking for his mom and we just need to find her. So there was a wellness check done at Heidi's West LA home and they found that Heidi wasn't there. Her car wasn't there, but her laptop and her phone was there. Jim said, the home was in pristine condition, but her phone and laptops were left behind. Now remember Heidi's dog, Seven? He was found roaming around in a building called the Hope and Flower on the 28th floor alone. 
And this was around three hours after Heidi was last seen on that surveillance footage walking downtown. Now, messages on Heidi's phone revealed that a stranger found Seven roaming around that 28th floor in the hallway and they tried contacting Heidi. Jim went to go pick up Seven from this person. The Hope and Flower are two luxury high-rise buildings in downtown LA, very close to the Staples Center. One building is 40 stories high and the other is 31. It was open to residents in February of 2020. Now from the outside, it looks like quite the property, very beautiful, but inside reveals something very different. And just a little note, it was first reported that no one saw Heidi in the building. And after reading the reviews of the Hope and Flower, I find it hard that no one did, especially reading some of the complaints. Here's some particular ones that caught my eye. In many of them, they talk about the elevators and wait times. On October 25th, so just shortly after Heidi went missing, a person made a review, a one-star review, and said the elevators take forever to come, like five to 10 minutes and not even during rush times. The resident services claims it's an algorithm, but the whole building agrees the algorithm sucks because the elevators take so long. In another one, it says, you'll often wait 15 to 25 minutes for an elevator to show up. And when it finally does, it, it'll often be too filled to even try to get inside of. Need to take the stairs? Concierge will question and ID you and they literally don't even know where they are. Apparently, you can only take the stairs down as they keep the ground floor door locked. Visitors of the building will park in your parking space and won't be towed. So it had me curious how not one person saw Heidi when these elevators are backed up. So there's tons of people in the elevators, these reviews are saying, and also the, the wait. So as you're waiting for the elevator, you're bound to see other people, right? Now in another one that was also just made 12 days after Heidi's disappearance, they're talking about an updated review and saying how living there was a nightmare. They show that the garbage is stacked up even though there's a garbage chute and they're just saying a lot of nightmares. Things like the building hasn't been washed in a year on the outside, people don't pick up after their pets, uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, specifically to a lot of complaints about the people who work at the building and security. Detectives seized security footage from the Hope and Flower, but interestingly, at first, the place wasn't cooperative and they refused to turn over that security footage without a warrant. So authorities went and obtained a search warrant. More on that in a minute. Here comes the plot twist. Heidi worked for a place called Camden Capital Partners. She was a financial controller there. Four days after Heidi's disappearance, Jim, Heidi's ex-husband, gets a phone call from the Securities and Exchange Commission, also known as the SEC. They wanted to ask Jim about a man named Jason Sugarman, Heidi's boss. He's a managing partner there. Jim said, they were interested in Sugarman and his company. They wanted to know what I know about them and just generally asked me what I thought about Sugarman. Now, Jason Sugarman and his business, Camden Capital Partners, are currently being investigated by the SEC for allegedly stealing $43 million from unwitting pension funds. Now, according to Jim, he believes the person who can answer the whereabouts of Heidi lies with Jason Sugarman and his company. He believes that there's foul play in Heidi's disappearance. And he said that he spoke to Jason Sugarman's assistant shortly after Heidi disappeared, but said that Jason didn't appear too concerned that she had gone missing. He said that Jason seemed more concerned to have her work computer returned. Jim said, while I was on the phone with his assistant, I heard Sugarman in the background barking at his assistant to tell me, make sure he knows I want my laptop. Jim said he never returned the laptop to them. Instead, he turned it over to the police. He also stated there was no concern at all from my ex-wife's employer. It's a multi-million dollar company. They didn't offer to hire a private investigator or put up a reward. The only thing they really seemed concerned about was Heidi's computer. Now, a few days later, Jim spoke with the assistant again, but this time the employee accused Heidi of siphoning off money from the company. Jim said, that's the most disparaging thing you can say about another person, especially when you are under investigation for stealing millions of dollars. 
He says, she's my ex-wife. I could say a lot of things. If there is one thing I would stand by, she wouldn't steal. For them to say that is such a bunch of hogwash. Now, when Jim told the employee that he didn't believe that to be true, the assistant claimed that they had proof and sent Jim several of Heidi's personal bank statements. Now, Jim said he never looked at the statements in depth and in detail and said he gave them to the police as soon as he received them. He said the authorities told him that Heidi didn't have a lot of money in her accounts. And Jim said, it was pretty low of Sugarman and his minions to accuse Heidi of basically embezzling when she's mysteriously disappeared. And he said he has no idea how Heidi's employer got their hands on her banking information. It was reported that Heidi was earning $125,000 a year plus monthly bonuses of up to $1,500 a month. She worked there for the past five years and she started out at Jason Sugarman's personal system and then working up her way into accounting. Jim said, Heidi knows all of Jason's and the company's secrets. She knows where the bones are buried. This whole thing just stinks. Something just isn't right and I can't put my finger on it. He says, if you had an employee for five years and unlimited resources, wouldn't you offer to help in the search? Jason didn't. Now, Jason hasn't been announced as a person of interest in the case publicly, but it has raised a lot of suspicions by Jim and also Heidi's friends. Now, what's interesting too is Jason Sugarman was actually seen on camera at Heidi's house delivering muffins a day or two after her disappearance. Now, I briefly mentioned this $43 million scheme earlier. Jason was charged in June of 2019 by the SEC, and it was said their target was Native Americans. Jim commented and said, Stealing from Native Americans is a whole new level of dirtbaggery. Dirtbags associate themselves with other dirtbags, and there are a lot of dirtbags around my wife's job. Good stays with good, bad stays with bad. There are a lot of bad people around Jason. In 2020, his business partner, Jason Galanis, I think that's how you say it, was sentenced to 189 months in prison for his role in multiple fraudulent schemes, including this tribal bond scheme, which is that $43 million. Now this Jason, because there's two Jasons, Sugarman and Galanis, Galanis has been linked to former Los Angeles crime family boss Rosario Sal Gambino and his son Tommy. He allegedly used his contacts to drag Hunter Biden into the scheme as well. It's reported that Hunter Biden's name was used as a selling point in the scheme. He was described in promotional brochures as a vice chairman for Burnham Financial Group, a firm later named as the alleged placement agent in the tribal bond offerings, which swindled the tribe. And speaking of bad stays with bad, in recent news, Jason Sugarman was also uh, hanging out with this girl in 2012. She's been all over the news and she was in court recently. Now there's pictures of the two at an Oscar party in West Hollywood. They were with a group of people who went for dinner at the Sunset Tower Hotel and then later partied across the street at the Chateau Marmont Hotel. Now on Friday, October 22nd, five days after Heidi went missing, Jim went to court to get sole custody of their son. The reasoning, he said, was, I urgently need these orders to put my son into therapy immediately because he is completely distraught at his mother's disappearance. He was awarded custody. Now there's been a little chitter chatter about that, but from my understanding, it's because he needs Heidi's permission to put his son in therapy as well because they're, you know, because of uh, the co-parenting, but he needed to go and get him help and he needed uh, to get sole custody in order to do so. Obviously he knows Heidi and he knows something's very wrong. He also said that day in another text to Heidi saying, we are also worried about you. Please contact someone, please. Heidi's son texted her several times as well and said, I really hope you're okay and I love you. A week later on Friday, October 29th in the evening, authorities obtained a warrant for Heidi's home and with their guns drawn, they entered. Now it's said that sources believe that officers were under the impression that they might have been walking into a crime scene. I'm curious about that. Photographers were on scene as well as nearly a dozen other agents who scoured every single room, the garbage, the planters around the whole entire home. Now it was reported that an evidence van was also on scene and some files were taken into custody, but still no sign of Heidi. 
On November 4th, Heidi's Range Rover was found in a different residential parking garage several blocks away from the Hope and Flower apartments. Now, it's my understanding in the Hope and Flower in regards to parking that it's kind of that concierge or valet um, deal. So I'm curious now, I'm thinking, I wonder if that's why Heidi parked away from that building because she knew that she had to valet it. So she found a place to park and then walked in so it's not, you know, a pain in the butt. Uh, there is complaints also about valet parking and it's very frustrating for a lot of the people there. Before all this happened, before Heidi's disappearance, it was said that Heidi sent a text to a guy who was said to be her boyfriend and she told him that she feels scared. Now, Heidi's cousin Trey said if the facts are true about her message to her boyfriend about being scared, then something terrible has happened to her. Her boyfriend lives in San Francisco and it was said that she's been with him for the last three years. Now, Jim thought that she had made a last minute decision to go visit him, but apparently Heidi texted her boyfriend that she was scared and wished that he was with her in the days before her sudden disappearance. They got into an argument because he said he had to work and he can't come and see her. And so she stopped talking to him or so he thought and ghosted him. Jim says that he's a great guy. He had no idea she was missing. Now, Heidi and Jim's son had a birthday shortly after her disappearance and he turned 11 years old. And Jim said, what kid wants to spend his birthday without his mom? We're just hoping for a miracle that she comes home. And her friend said that there's just no way that she would take off, especially because of her son. Now, there's a little bit of a history of mental instability for Heidi in her past. She has she had a little bit of mental health issues back in 2015. She checked herself into a psychiatric facility in October of 2015, and Jim also requested custody of their son in 2015. He said that Heidi had a history of acting out in volatile ways. Now, let's go back to the authorities and the warrant. They said that they found evidence at the Hope and Flower, which leads them to believe that Heidi is no longer alive. Authorities said forensic evidence was located inside the building, which has led detectives to believe an incident occurred resulting in Plank's death. And from there, they started searching landfills. On November 29th, they obtained a search warrant and searched the Chiquita Canyon landfill. They used excavators, heavy machinery, and hand tools to search through the trash. Now it's understood that they were led to this landfill because it is where the waste disposal company who works at the apartment building dumps its trash. Now they had to pause the search in December, but they announced recently that they will continue the search. There was issues with really heavy rain in December and one of the excavators brought to the site also broke down. And so they had to replace that before the search resumed as well. Now, they will resume this upcoming week, and an update will happen if a significant amount of information is found and is associated to the investigation. There is chitter chatter that there was a garbage chute involved in Heidi's death. If you have any information regarding the whereabouts of Heidi, please contact the Los Angeles Police Department's Missing Persons Unit at 213-996-1800 and during non-business hours or on weekends, you can call 1-877-LAPD 24-7. That's 1-877-527-3247. And anyone wishing to remain anonymous can call the Los Angeles Regional Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. That's 1-800-222-8477 or, or go directly to lacrimestoppers.org. This case, has so many different moving parts to it, I feel. We have the business, and that kind of gives me that Ray Rivera case vibe of his boss, Porter Stansberry, you know, the shady boss kind of thing. He was in trouble too with the SEC. But then here it also makes you wonder, why is she going downtown? Is it connected to her, her boss or her company? And why did she leave so abruptly in her son's game? And does she have more than one phone? Because one of the phones was found or her phone was found at her uh, residence. And why didn't she leave with her phone? And what was she afraid of in the days before her disappearance? And who else knew about her being afraid? And to what extent? Let me know your thoughts below. Also, let me know what is the one thing that you'd really love to know about in this case? 
What is the one question that you're asking yourself, what the heck? Let me know below. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like and please share. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon.